And again, just as we come together, and this is our hopefully first annual uh, get together. Uh, we would like to be doing this each year. Uh, of course, we have done the uh, FBFI meetings here, and that has always just been a tremendous blessing. But the more churches that got involved, the longer it was between having get togethers here. And so we decided, you know what, let's just go ahead. We'll have a, a Bible conference, and we will not get in the way of the FBFI. And Pastor Bruce and I talked about that, and they said, well, we're going to go here. And I said, okay, I'll go there. And, and so, again, we're just really looking forward to this. Uh, I find it very exciting to have the men that we have. And I just want to welcome you uh, here. And, and again, pick up a schedule on the back table. Be here as often as you can. And of course, that schedule is going to tell you who is speaking, when they're speaking, and, uh, and of course, when the meals are. And, and so keep all of those things in mind. But again, uh, this conference is a Stand Fast Bible Conference. As I talked to a number of different people when I first had that idea, and it was, you know what, if there has ever been a time for the church to stand fast, this is that time. Amen. And so the men that I chosen, as soon as I gave that, that theme, that direction, they both were just on board. Like basically, immediately, yes, we can do this. We will we'll be glad to help with that. And, of course, that was a great encouragement to me. And so I'm going to stop talking and uh, get to the preaching. Take your Bibles, if you will. And the scripture verse for this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. And so we're going to be starting there. I'm going to read verses 7 through 15. I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's word. Let me, let me go ahead and, and begin with verse 1. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the work of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to be to uh, the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or epistle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time tonight. Bless this time that we have. And Heavenly Father, God, may you be honored. May you be glorified. Will we be challenged, heart and mind? And God, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. You know, starting that passage and not reading it all, uh, I guess once I looked at it again, I thought, that's not going to make sense. We really need to just move through the whole thing. But again, stand fast. Uh, this is that command. We are, this isn't a suggestion to the church. 
This is a command to the church. How are we to deal with the problems of the world? And in this passage that was just read, there are those who are absolute, complete rejectors of God, rejectors of Christ. They had nothing to do with God whatsoever. And it is told us here in verse, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the work of, of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And it goes on with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. It isn't that God, you know, has hidden anything from mankind. He has revealed all those things to them, and yet they, with as this is telling us, these lying wonders, all deceivableness. Listen, they're completely, totally deceived. They have believed a lie and will believe the lie when that time comes. And, and the, the wonder of all of that is when we get down there just a little bit further and it says, but we, suddenly we shift gears. It's not them. It's not the damned. It's not those who did not believe, although God showed them love and mercy and kindness. Now it's talking about those who did believe. And, and that glorious relationship that we have now, but my consider the relationship that we will have in the future, the wonder and the glory of eternity with God. But this matter of standing fast, we live in a day and age that, that is a horrible time right now. I'm gonna to just touch on that a, a little bit, but I also wanna back up and do a bit of history. When we are told here to stand fast, we're talking 2,000 years ago. You know, listen, what is going on, the wickedness, the vileness of this world is nothing new. This was happening 2,000 years ago, and they are warned, therefore, brethren, because of all these things you've just learned, because of what we have just looked at, therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. They're talking about the very words of God, and they're talking about the epistles that, again, what we get those. Those who wrote the New Testament is a reference here. And, and how did we get them? Holy Spirit to them, to the page, to us. And we have the wonder of the epistles. And so the word of God, these beautiful letters that have been written to us, we have them and we are to hang on. Listen, stand fast and hold the traditions. The idea there of traditions, it is instructions, it is narrative, it is precept as given by the word of God. Okay, a lot of times you, you'll come down to, oh, word tradition, you know, well, that can mean anything. Not in context. When we come to this and we accept it in context of the word, then this is talking clearly, these traditions, not the traditions of men, but the traditions, again, that we receive those instructions, narrative, precepts that we are given by the word of God. Amen. Listen, those are the traditions in which this is telling us that we must hang on to. And not only that, but it also, this matter of being taught. And, and being taught is it, it, it's where impart, imparted instruction has been given. And again, where does that instruction come from? It comes from God. And so if I'm going to hold on to these traditions, I'm going to listen to what is taught by the word. And again, we go right back to a word that, that many of us have looked at many times, this word logos. Well, logos, again, very broad understanding of the word. It can, you know, it can go all kinds of different directions, but not in context. And so when you come here and you look by the word, you know, you're saying, the word of God, his moral precepts, his eternal truths is what this is referring to. And, and so the wonder, again, of that which we have been given, even just these few short verses. But this was given 2,000 years ago. And, and I want to take just a little bit of time, uh, if I can get my papers straightened out here, and, and, and look, you know, where did all of this start? 
Well, it started way back then, but as I was coming through, I said, you know what? I don't have that much time. I can't start 2,000 years ago and work through all of this. So let me just back up to like 1884, and we'll pick up there, okay? I might be able to work through that. But again, in picking up there, and Spurgeon was mentioned yesterday, and so let me mention him again. Uh, Spurgeon, again, great Baptist preacher in Britain, uh, had the largest church in the Baptist Union, uh, was the most influential man within that group of people, and he began to see something that ultimately was called, called the downgrade. And he began to see within that group that they started Again, step down, step down, and what's that? Away from the Word of God, away from the truth of the Word of God. But he stayed in the Baptist Union. Listen, he had, these are the men he had, he had fellowshiped with, men he had preached with and preached for. These were men who supported him. And so he stayed in until finally, and he had a, a paper called The Sword and Trowel, and he was the editor of that paper. And in having that paper, uh, there was suddenly began to appear anonymous letters. I think there was three. It might have been more than that. But ultimately, they were written by a friend of his. And they were talking about what was going on, this slippage, this downgrade that was going on. And finally, Spurgeon himself, because again, he knew his personal influence. And he didn't want to just, you know, suddenly just start and say, hey, look, we're wrong. And he, from what I understand, he really battled with that until finally he said, okay, this has to be dealt with. And he writes a six-page response to what is going on in the Baptist Union. I'm not going to read all six pages, okay? <laughs> but I am going to read uh, oh, about a paragraph. And he writes, no lover of the gospel can conceal from himself the fact that the days are evil. We are willing to make a large discount from our apprehensions, our worries, on the score of natural timidity. He's saying, listen, I don't want to jump down your throat. You know, I'm, I'm, so we've been holding off on this because of natural timidity. The, the caution of age and the weakness produced by pain. He's referring to himself. He was a sick man at this point. He, he is racked with gout and pain. Uh, he, he has some other physical ailments. This is towards the end, of, I think, the, about the last five years of his life. And so he's literally referring to, to himself, this natural timidity, the caution of age, uh, the weakness produced by pain. But yet our solemn conviction is the things are much worse in many churches uh, than they seem to be and are rapidly tending downward. And again, that's where the, the downgrade, the idea of that began. Read those newspapers which represent the broad school of dissent and ask yourself, this broad school of dissent that he's referring to are those who are dissenting against the word of God, the traditions that they had all held, the doctrines that they had all held. And now there's, they're dissenting. They're pulling away. Listen, things are getting worse. They're becoming more liberal, if you will. How much further could they go? Remember that question. Okay, this is Spurgeon, 1884. How much further could they go? What doctrine remains to be abandoned? What other truth to be object of contempt? A new religion has been initiated. He is talking among his Baptist brethren, okay? Which is no more Christianity than chalk is cheese. He said, look, th this is not even Christianity anymore. What you people are teaching, it's, it's beyond, again, the pale. And this religion being destitute of moral honesty. My, I'll tell you what, there's some men sitting here who have watched some of our Bible colleges go down the drains, and much of that was what? They were destitute of, of, of moral honesty. You would ask them, you look, or you would point out, you're changing. You're going a direction that is not, oh, no, we're not. No, we're, we're not changing. I want to tell you what, that is a lack of moral character. And they lied to the point, and they finally closed the doors on some of the colleges. Right. And there were churches who followed. Palms itself off as old faith with slight improvements. Does that sound familiar to you? And on this plea usurps pulpits which were erected for gospel preaching. 
How many Baptist churches across this nation right now, the pulpits have been usurped by men who no longer take the stand that that church took, but yet signed the Constitution saying they did when they came? I want to, again, that, that is a moral collapse. Again, which were erected for gospel preaching. The atonement is scouted. The inspiration of scripture derided. The Holy Spirit is degraded to an influence. The punishment of sin is turned into fiction and the resurrection to a myth. And yet these enemies of our faith expect us to call them brethren and maintain a confederacy with them. I mean, that, that is one paragraph of six pages. I want to tell you what Spurgeon scorched them. And, and they needed it. But listen, we look around us today and we see what is going on today. And we can know, listen, this was all started 2,000 years ago. And has continued to follow along to the days of Spurgeon. And after that, we moved in about 19... 1909, 1910, somewhere around in there. And what? There's the argument between modernists and what ultimately became fundamentalists. And this argument begins. And what was the argument about? Spurgeon asked, how, worse, how much worse can this get? Oh, it gets worse. Because then they were, oh, watering things down a little bit. By this time, they are denying the deity of Jesus Christ. By 1909. They're denying the deity of Christ. And so they wrote the fundamentals and just basically uh, the argument uh, that they tried to, again, make sure that everybody understood a true believer, a real church, this is what it believes and not what the modernists are teaching. And so they began to set out what the deity of Jesus Christ, salvation, grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it was in fact real and bodily. Right. It must be set out. Why? Because the others rejected it. The gospel. And what is the gospel? Well, salvation. Well, wait a minute, but exactly what is it? How do you explain it? Is, is it real? Is it eternal? So they also had to argue what is the gospel? They had to argue one God in three people, the Trinity. Listen, all those things had to be laid out, and it, they chose just these simple things to say, this is what a true church of Jesus Christ is and what it represents. And so, again, we, we move along from 2,000 years ago uh, to that reality of Spurgeon, 1880s, uh, to here in the early 1900s. Modernism, again, which they were arguing against, and they became known as fundamentalists, the modernist movement began in that late 19th century as a reaction to traditionalism. They looked at the traditionalism of the church, and they said, you know what, this is way out of step. Because we know that reason, human reasoning, and what else? Science. Human reasoning and science. It has the answer and not that antiquated word of God that these men keep preaching Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Listen, this has to be done away with. Listen, we're modern people. We've had modern educations. Preachers, you've got to stop this. And so that, again, that fundamentalist, modernist controversy was a theological debate that took place there in that early part of the 20th century. And mostly, again, within Protestantism. And, you know, back they included us in, in, in with Protestants, and I won't, I won't argue about that right now. But again, the controversy pitted fundamentalists against modernists, and each side argued their respect. Honestly, Fundamentalism won, but modernism kept hanging on and kept hanging on. And there were churches then, again, that split. There were those who went with science, who went with human reasoning, and there were, thank the Lord, more that went with a more fundamentalist stand. You know, when I first started to hear about this, you know, many years ago, and, and I was thinking, you know, what's, you know, that, that, that was probably a bunch of Baptists that wrote that, Right? until I, I got the five-volume set of the fundamentals. You are hard-pressed 
to find a Baptist in, 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 in the authors of that. I mean, there, there, were, there were men from all denominations, again, almost across the board. A few, of course, were missing. But that reality of, listen, no, this is what the real church of God believes. Amen. And back then, it would, no, this is what the Presbyterians believe. If you're going to be a real church, look, you have to believe this. You have to believe the deity of Christ. You have to do these things. And Lutherans and, and many other, Church of Scotland and Many men from a lot of different places and directions all came together and said, no, this is what we believe. This is what the true church must believe and complete rejection of modernism. But again, it's continued 2,000 years. They've been tearing the church down, tearing the church down. Liberals, and I don't care if they're political liberals or religious liberals, liberals are willing to take one bite at a time and conservatives want the whole shebang. And so what? Ultimately, what does that lead to? Compromise. Well, what we, just, just, we just want this little bit. Listen, they are willing to get a little bit and not get another bite until they're dead, and then some other liberal takes over, and they will continue to work on it, continue to chip away at it, continue to move forward with it, until what? They have the whole enchilada. But it's one bite at a time. World War I came around, threw the, the whole world again in, into, into a panic. Uh, it was the war to end all wars. This was, this was going to no more war after World War I. But the war ended. Uh, those who were our allies won. And then we went into a time. Uh, prohibition came around about that time. And, and threw all the drunks in, into a rage. And the Roaring Twenties was upon. And now the Roaring Twenties was a vile, wicked time for all those who were involved in it. And that went on until what? 1929. The Black Friday, the stock market crashed, and suddenly nobody had anything. Listen, that was a time of then some people starting to turn back to the reality of the Word of God. Suddenly they have nothing. Well, what do we do? Where do we turn? And they started to turn to prayer. They started to turn back to God. And then along comes Hitler, uh, the Nazis, uh, ultimately World War II. But the pre-war, things were moving along a little bit, come along a little bit. But I want to tell you what, it was post-World War II where we see this little window of time. The men come home from the war. They've been all over the world. They've been all over Europe. They've been in, in North Africa. They have been uh, in the Philippines. They have been in Pacific Islands. They've been all over. And the men come home, especially the believers and a number of them that, that became believers during the war. And they came home and said, God's called me to go back. He wants me to go to the Philippines. He wants me to go to Japan. He wants me to go to Germany. He wants me to go. And, and they came home and they went to the three-year Bible institutes, many of them, like Moody Bible Institute and others. And as quick as they could be trained, they went to the field. And one of the, the greatest missionary outreaches of history began to take place. And so through that late 40s, all through the 50s, into the 60s, Missionary work around the world was an amazing thing. But then the 1960s came. And suddenly, the April 8th issue, 1966, of Time magazine asked the question, and big question mark, is God dead? And had their articles concerning, is God dead? After that, and again, much debate, and many people, and college campuses, one of the things that took place, and secular college campuses, while, you know, things were starting to look pretty good after the Second World War, all the missionary activities, the churches are, are just enraptured with what's going on and supporting missions around the world and all of those things, and they're paying no attention to what's going on in the secular colleges. And they are being taught, not, is God dead?, they're being taught God is dead. 
And that began to filter in not only to the colleges, but the high schools and younger and younger and younger people. In August of, or April of 13, 2009, Newsweek magazine, their cover said, the decline and fall of American Christianity. Not is it falling, the decline and fall of American Christianity. This is the direction that all of these things have been headed. You know, yes, we can point back and say, well, that, that started 2,000 years ago. But it continued to ramp up and ramp up and ramp up. And then also in the 1960s, 1962, 1963, when ultimately the Bible and prayer was removed from schools by the Supreme Court of the United States. It went through the court systems, ultimately ended up in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled eight to one, eight to one, that devotional Bible reading or other government-sponsored religious activities in public schools are unconstitutional in the United States of America. One of the worst days in American history. As these realities and looking again at this matter of stand fast, we have a reason to stand fast. It's interesting as we look back at what, what were some of the things that have been said concerning the United States and its relationship to God. Thomas Jefferson wrote, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. I've heard a lot of men talking about we're just about done. God is just about done with us. And Jefferson died in 1826. And he was already saying that justice cannot sleep forever. Also, Abraham Lincoln said, of destruction be our lot. If America is going to be destroyed, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. And what is he saying? Listen, if this country falls, if this country is destroyed, it's our fault. We are the ones that will bring it down. Also, uh, Lester Roloff, some of you know Lester Roloff, and, and he was talking about this very thing. And his conclusion was, this is insanity because we're in sin. It's because of sin. It's because the nation is in sin. That the, the sinful action was going on all the way back then. He died in 82 before all of this other stuff even came to light. The Constitution was made for a moral people, John Adams. The penalty... For good men, that good men pay for indifference to public affairs is to be ruled by evil men. Just don't pay attention. Just let it slide by, and we'll end up being ruled by evil men. By the way, that was written by Plato. I'm going to quote somebody I don't believe I've ever quoted before uh, from the pulpit. Old-fashioned, spirit-filled, Christ-honoring, sin-hating, soul-winning, Bible-preaching is the hope of the church, it's the hope of the nation, and it's the hope of the world. Jack Hiles. We have not government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. John Adams. Listen, the Constitution that we have is co completely incapable of ruling an ungodly people. And then today, and, and I just, I'm, I'm not going to read very many of, of these things because it's just, there's so much of the same. But we now move into transgendering. Say, well, oh yeah, you know, that California, New York, and you know, no, and our government is, is feeding it. Our government is pushing it. Our government wants to see these things done. It's amazing to me, and 
that Charles Haddon Spurgeon when he wondered, can, can any more happen? Oh yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think those men could have even come close to beginning to have an understanding of what was going to happen in the future. Um, again, uh, public schools. Uh, elementary school teachers are putting words on the blackboard like non-binary and transgender before they teach the children mathematics. A Minnesota family forced their public school with a lawsuit to teach about transgenderism to five-year-olds. Um, Illinois, California, Colorado, New Jersey, Oregon require LBGTQ plus instruction in all public schools. And on and on, I have two pages in small print. It, it, it just doesn't stop. And the reality is, wait a minute, Pastor, but that's public school. That's, no. Do you know how many churches are now flying the rainbow flag? Today. How many are instructing their congregations that listen, uh, God is love, Christ is love, and so we must love them. I will not argue that we're to love them, but I will argue we're to hate their sin. And that, again, as we, we back up 50 years ago, and, and people gasped when ladies were allowed in the pulpit. Oh, my goodness. And then other things came around, and the divorced were allowed in the pulpit. Another gasp. Oh, my. Well, then homosexuals were allowed in the pulpit. And now the LGBTQ plus are taking the pulpits, taking leadership in the churches, sitting on board so that they have a proper amount of diversity and fairness. And the churches are saying, well, yes, we must do this. Yes, we, we must have this. We must do this because Jesus is love. You know what? Jesus is love. And I want to tell you the people I've just been talking about, I happen to love them. But I love them enough to tell them the truth. Amen. And my friend, to tell them the truth in love. Not ornery, not finger in their face, but to tell them the truth in love. They are a soul for whom Christ died. There was a, I read an article a number of years ago, and uh, it was just about an experience uh, that these folks had had, and they're pretty well-known believers. And it was mom and her son were on a plane, and there was a guy on the plane, and he wanted everybody to know real, that he was gay. Uh, you, you've probably seen some of these people, and, and I mean, he really wanted to project, you know, want everybody to know. And the son said something, and he said it loud enough so everyone around them could hear, and he said something funny about it, and everybody laughed. And his mother turned to him, and she said, you laugh. He said, God cries. God cries. They're a soul for whom Christ died. Listen, I can find all kinds of bad things to say, but I can't find them in the book. We need to be so very careful. Are we judgmental? I hope my judgments come from the word of God. But again, backing up into where we were looking, this stand fast Bible conference, this matter of stand fast, it, it, it is stako is the Greek word, and it means steadfast of mind or one who does not waver. We're to stand fast. We're to be steadfast of mind, of understanding, of not letting go. The verse here, verse 15, starts out, therefore, that's ara in the Greek. So therefore, or so then. Listen, that which we have just looked at, that's what we have just been taught. And then he says, brethren. Well, brother, hey, brethren can again be one of those broad-based words, but here, obviously, means brethren in Christ. Those with whom we love and walk with. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions. Listen, 
Paradosis is, is, is again that, that traditions, that instruction, narrative, precept as given by the word of God. How do I stand fast? I stand fast, again, by what I am taught by the scriptures, that imparted instructions, that instill doctrine within our lives. That's how we stand fast. And we don't have a hold of those things and say, I will not move. I don't care how many people say I need to move. I don't care what's going on in the world. I don't care what's going on in my community. I don't care if a, a council of pastors come against me. I cannot. I cannot deny the word of God, which again is what they were wanting Spurgeon to do. Spurgeon had a position. Spurgeon knew where he stood, and they wanted him to change his stand. At one point in time, they wanted him to go further uh, with a statement that he was willing to go. And finally, Spurgeon answered them, and he said, I will not sacrifice the word of God on the altar of my theology. I won't sacrifice the word of God on the altar of my theology. I said, Amen. <laughs> what a great statement. But walking through this, these things that we are taught, how am I taught? We're taught by the word, the sayings of God, his moral precepts, his eternal truths. That's what we have in the book. And when we begin to think, you know what, maybe they have, you know what, they, maybe they have a point. Maybe they have a point. Maybe we should just love them. Maybe we should just Allow them be included. Be inclusive in the church. Actually be members. Be on the board. You know, is that really ungodly? That would be yes. That would be yes. This reality. And then lastly, again, that word epistle. We've already talked about that. This letter, this written message from God. And I think that is the thing that we always must truly remember this, these epistles, these letters, this book that we have, this is from God to us. Amen. Right. Amen. This is his words. This isn't arguable. This isn't something that is defined by the world. This is something that is defined in our hearts by the Holy Spirit of God. Right. He is the illuminator of the word of God to us. And as we walk with him, as we walk in those doctrines, as we embrace them unashamedly and unwillingly to ever give them up, I believe that is why we need to stand fast. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this time already. We look so forward. We have two more speakers tonight. And I personally really am looking forward to that. I just pray you bless this time. You bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And as I promised, we have a break.